everyone. So today's topic is seven tips for analyzing arguments. So I want to start off with just kind of a big picture overview of everything that we've covered when talking about critical thinking. So first, we went over some background concepts. Um, two of the most important are truth. We talked about how truth is correspondence to the world. And we also talked about rational belief and how rational belief is relative to someone's body of evidence. And we also talked a little bit about knowledge and what knowledge is and how rational belief plays a role in knowledge. Um, and then we um, basically covered three steps of argument analysis. And although we didn't cover them in this order, I'll just go ahead and go in order. So the first step is to identify an argument. And we talked here about three different kinds of writing, descriptive writing, which describes um, objects or events, rhetorical writing, which aims to convince but doesn't give reasons or evidence, and then argumentative writing, which um, has a conclusion and then has premises, which are reasons or evidence for that conclusion. Step two is to reconstruct the argument. So once you identify that a piece of writing is um, argumentative writing, you're going to reconstruct the argument in standard form. So first you identify the conclusion and then you identify the premises, the author's supporting reasons for that conclusion. And then you apply the principles of charity and faithfulness to your reconstructed argument. And then finally, you have this reconstructed argument that is hopefully both strong and also true to the author's intentions, and then you evaluate it. You ask yourself, is it valid? Do the premises um, necessarily guarantee the truth of the conclusion? And then are the premises themselves true, reasonable to believe, or known? So that's just sort of like a big picture summary of what we have covered in um, this series of videos on critical thinking. And what I wanna to do today is kind of give seven almost miscellaneous tips, but tips that can help us in this process of argument analysis. Um, a lot of these tips will fall under step three, which is argument evaluation. Um, but when we discussed argument evaluation, we mostly talked about what are the features of good arguments? What makes something a good argument? Um, and then we talked about validity and we talked about having premises that are strong, sound and known, right? Um, but we didn't fully cover the best way to object to an argument. If an argument's wrong, what are ways that you would show it's wrong? Um, I think we didn't fully address that question. We did talk about it some, but not fully. And so this video is going to discuss, among other things, ways to an object to an argument well, um, and then just some other things to keep in mind when analyzing arguments. Okay, so we're gonna talk about seven tips for analyzing arguments, and basically there's one tip per slide. So tip number one, it's don't criticize an argument by simply denying its conclusion. Okay, so in most cases, when we're reconstructing an argument in order to analyze it, we want our argument to be valid. The premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion. So if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true, right? Um, so if you give me a valid argument for some conclusion, and I wanna to object to that argument, and my objection is essentially, the conclusion is false. You know, that could be a, a decent point to make, but it is not challenging the argument itself. To challenge the argument itself, if it's valid, you need to challenge one of the argument's premises. And so when we're trying to object to an argument, just saying the conclusion is false, that's not really an effective way to go because the author is basically trying to say, here's my support and here's my reasons for the conclusion. And so even though saying the conclusion is false is sort of relevant in the grand scheme of things, in a way it's changing the subject. You're not looking at the author's support or reason for their conclusion. Um, and if our goal is to analyze the author's argument that they gave, then we shouldn't just deny the conclusion. We need to look at the premises themselves and deny those. So here's an example. Let's say Bob says there's a first cause. If there's a first cause, then God exists. 
therefore God exists. So Bob is trying to make this argument for the existence of God. And he's discussing this argument with John. And then John wants to resist Bob's argument. And let's say John responds in this way. Premise three is, well, which is the conclusion. So, you know, the conclusion is false. God doesn't exist. If God did exist, why is there so much evil in the world? Okay, so John has raised an important question and a question that's worth thinking about, right? But note what John has not done. John has not given us a reason to doubt Bob's argument. John hasn't actually really engaged with Bob's argument at all. John's just given us a separate reason to think Bob's conclusion is false. And it's really more just a question than a reason, right? So John is not engaging in argument analysis. And if what John wants to do is interact with Bob's argument specifically, John needs to do more than just deny Bob's conclusion. He needs to talk to us about Bob's premises. So that's tip number one. Don't criticize an argument by denying its conclusion. Tip number two, don't accept an argument simply because you believe its conclusion. This tip is super important because I do see people do this. So here's a really important thing to note. There are bad arguments for true conclusions. <laughs> um, here's a bad argument for a conclusion that could be true. A university is good if and only if it is located in Texas. Ryerson is located in Texas. Therefore, Ryerson is a good university. Okay, so even if three is true, even if we accept three, this doesn't give us a reason to accept this argument. I mean, it is a valid argument, but both of the premises are false. There are good universities that don't exist in Texas and Ryerson is not located in Texas, right? So just because you think Ryerson's a good university does not mean you should accept this argument. And I think you should feel totally comfortable saying this is a weak argument. This is not a good reason to think that Ryerson is a good university, even if you think the conclusion is true. But when people hold to certain controversial views, so maybe you like gun control is bad or God exists or, you know, whatever. I, I think sometimes people feel a need to accept every single argument for their view, accept every argument or every possible way you might support this conclusion that they agree with. And to be honest, this, this just isn't an intellectually honest practice because for every single view, um, there's probably some good and some bad arguments. Maybe they, there might not be good arguments for every single view, but there's definitely bad arguments for pretty much any view. And if we want to be an honest person, we need to look at an argument and not just ask ourselves, do I agree or disagree with this, this conclusion, but use our method of argument analysis to figure out, is this a strong argument? Is it valid? And then do we have reason to accept these premises? So whether we accept or reject an argument should not be based on whether we agree with the conclusion. Um, that's what I just said. So we want to be able to say, I agree with your conclusion but I just don't think that's a good reason to accept it. That's a good intellectually, intellectually honest thing to say. And I think we should all practice saying that. Okay, tip number three, when you're criticizing an argument, you wanna direct your criticism at one of the argument's premises. So sometimes you hear an argument and it feels a little bit fishy. You think that there's probably something wrong with this argument, but I'm not really sure which premise is false. Um, and you might be tempted to offer some kind of like general criticism of the argument. Like, ah, this, is, this argument just feels wrong. Like, I just don't know. I don't know what's going on here, but this, this argument can't be right. Um, but as long as the argument is valid, your objection shouldn't just be this kind of general criticism. You should direct your objection at a specific premise. Um, and you can direct it at more, and more, more than one premise as well, but it should be at least directed at one of the argument's premises. So here's an example. Um, premise one, our actions are either caused or random. Premise two, if our actions are either caused or random, then we don't have free will. Conclusion, therefore we don't have free will. So you might think, well, there's something wrong with this argument, but it's just not totally clear which premise we should deny. Um, and free will is a really, it's a really hard problem. It's a really difficult, um, it's a really difficult to explain how we have free will. But 
Um, if you're wanting to resist this argument, the point here is that you either need to direct your criticism at premise one or at premise two. Um, it's not, again, this is kind of like in some ways echoing tip one, you can't just say that conclusion is false. You need to direct your criticism at one of the premises. Um, so you can also, in addition, provide arguments the conclusion is false. But again, like we talked about, you're not criticizing this argument, you're providing another argument. So in a way, you're changing the subject. It's still on the topic of free will, but you're giving us a, a different reason to believe the conclusion is false rather than actually interacting with this argument as stated. Okay, tip four, make your criticisms of the premises substantial. We're gonna talk about what that means. So here's some examples of unsubstantial criticisms of premises. Premise X might be false. There's a chance that it's false. Simply appealing to the possibility that a premise is false, it's not a substantial criticism. You haven't proven, you haven't proved to me that the premise is true. Well, proof is a pretty high standard. Um, and what we've talked about quite a bit is that we don't need to be that 100% sure that something is true before we should accept it. And when we, the standard that we hold our premises to is reasonableness. If our premises are reasonable and supported by our evidence, then we should accept them, even if it's not, we don't have total and complete proof. So pointing out that someone hasn't proved that a premise is true isn't a substantial criticism, unless you're also saying you haven't even given us any evidence for it or any reason to think that it's reasonable. There's also what's called argument stoppers. And these are ways that people respond to arguments that cut off rational discussion. So saying you only believe that because, well, that's focusing on them as a person. And that's not focusing on the premises of their argument. Look at the reasons they gave for their conclusion. It doesn't matter for the argument why they do or do not believe it. That's not what you're supposed to be focusing on. You should be focusing on the reasons that they gave you for their conclusion. You know, who's to say that's true? That's kind of like saying this premise might be false. Like who says that's true? It just doesn't really advance the discussion. That's just your opinion. We're gonna talk about soon why I think appealing to facts versus opinions is not a good way to respond to arguments. That's subjective. People use this word in, in <laughs> very weird ways um, that are not the ways that philosophers use it at all. But um, I think in most cases saying that's subjective is not gonna be a, a good use of that term. Um, and it's not a good way to respond to an argument or criticize a premise. Instead, you should criticize a premise using a substantial criticism. So like we've talked about, this argument is invalid. The conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. Or here's a good reason to think premise X is false. Premise X is not reasonable to believe. Here is why. So when you're trying to decide, is this criticism substantial or not substantial? Ask yourself, does this objection show the argument is weak? Does it show that, you know, again, the argument's not valid or there's something wrong with one of the premises? Um, and then also ask yourself, is there an obvious response to this objection? So put yourself in the other person's shoes. Is there some way that they could easily tweak their argument or, you know, maybe make some slight clarification to account for it? And again, we've talked a lot about, we wanna be charitable to the people that, whose arguments we're analyzing. We want to make their arguments as strong as possible, consistent with their intentions. And so if you're attacking an argument and they could easily um, fix the argument in light of your criticism, that's probably a good sign that it is not a substantial criticism. Okay, tip number five. Um, which I just alluded to, do not distinguish between facts and opinions. I hate this distinction. <laughs> Some people like to try to make a distinction between facts and opinions. And they say something like this, facts are things that have a, a right or wrong answer and opinions do not. So for example, it's a fact that water is H2O, but it's just an opinion that the Democratic Party is leading America in the right direction. Okay, I think this is not a helpful distinction. I don't think it's something we should be appealing to. 
The reason is because both of these above statements are either true or false. The difference between them is that the one that's an opinion, it's just more controversial. It's difficult to evaluate. It's hard to weigh the evidence for and against it. Um, whereas the first one is one that most of us have pretty good evidence for. It's a pretty well-established fact among the scientific community, but also most people are sort of aware of this fact, right? So what I wanna encourage you to do is erase this distinction from your vocabulary. Do not use this distinction when criticizing arguments. And I think a better distinction is between propositions that are clearly supported or established by our evidence. So, you know, given our current evidence, most of us have very good reason to believe the earth is round and that water is H2O. So we have, there's certain propositions or statements that we have really good evidence for. There are other propositions or statements that are not yet established by our evidence. Um, the evidence is really complicated. There's not a clear consensus on the matter. Some of us probably have evidence for, some of us have it against, but there's not this like clear community standard that is like, we have really good evidence that this is correct. And for many um, moral, political, and religious questions, um, our evidence is just hard to evaluate. And our evidence has not yet fully settled or established the matter. Um, and so note that both of these categories concern propositions. Propositions, like we talked about in the truth video, they're either true or false. There's a right or a wrong answer. You know, either eating factory farm meat is morally wrong or it is not, right? So the question isn't, is this a fact or is this just your opinion? No, all of these are facts in the sense that there's either a right or a wrong answer. There's just cases where we have easy access to the truth and then cases where we're still learning the truth, we're still weighing and evaluating the evidence and evidence can be hard to assess. And sometimes we don't have all the evidence, you know, kind of think about open scientific questions or unproven mathematical theorems. We're still looking at the evidence, we're still gathering the evidence in some of these cases. So instead of talking about facts and opinions, think about our evidence and things that are established by our evidence and things that we're still working out. Propositions are always gonna be either true or false but sometimes our evidence is just more difficult to evaluate than in other cases. Okay, tip number six is don't accept competing arguments. So competing arguments, there are two arguments. And the first argument concludes P. The second argument concludes not P. So P is true versus P is false. That's what a competing argument is. For example, Someone might say, there's a first cause, then God exists. There's a first cause, then God exists. Um, and then a second argument. If there's pointless evil, then God does not exist. There's pointless evil, therefore God does not exist. So one of these arguments says God does exist. One of these arguments says God does not exist. So these are competing arguments. They have opposite conclusions. If you accepted both arguments at the same time, you would actually be accepting a contradiction. So both of these arguments are valid, but they both cannot be known and they both cannot be sound. So we shouldn't accept both of them. What this does not mean though, they could both provide interesting and, and even compelling evidence. Um, so both of these could be evidentially weighty. Both of them could be interesting. Both of them could be worth thinking about and working through and thinking about support for and against the premises. Um, it's also true that let's say we, we accepted this first argument that um, if there's a first cause and God exists, we accept that as an argument for God's existence. That does not mean that then we should ignore arguments like the second argument. We shouldn't ignore them at all. Um, we should look at those arguments with an open mind and then see if they're strong arguments. And if they are, we should change our confidence. And sometimes we should even give up our beliefs, right? Um, so just because we accept an argument doesn't mean we should just ignore all of the arguments with competing conclusions. We just shouldn't accept them both at the same time. But if we close ourselves off to arguments that have conclusions we disagree with, uh, we don't have the opportunity to get new evidence. And sometimes those arguments can cause us to reevaluate our positions. Um, another thing to note, competing arguments can both be bad. 
So just because they have they have opposite conclusions doesn't mean they both couldn't be bad arguments. So you can reject competing arguments. You just can't accept both competing arguments. Okay, tip number seven. Don't object to intermediate conclusions of compound arguments. Okay, so what's a compound argument? What a compound argument does is it takes multiple arguments and links them together to build on each other. So for example, premise one, the forecast predicts rain tomorrow. Premise two, if the forecast predicts rain tomorrow, then it will rain tomorrow. So conclusion, it will rain tomorrow. That's our first conclusion. But no, we can build on that conclusion. So we can say, well, if it will rain tomorrow, then it won't be fun to go to the beach tomorrow. And so from that premise four in our first conclusion three, we get our next conclusion. Uh, therefore, it won't be fun to go to the beach tomorrow. And notice we can keep building actually. <laughs> if it won't be fun to go to the beach tomorrow, then we shouldn't go to the beach tomorrow. Therefore, we shouldn't go to the beach tomorrow. So notice that premises one and two support premise three. That's kind of what's called an intermediate conclusion. And then that intermediate conclusion in premise four support the next intermediate conclusion, which is, which is five. And then premise six plus the second intermediate conclusion support the ultimate conclusion, which is seven. Okay, so we basically have three arguments that are kind of linked together that give us this ultimate conclusion. And if we were going to object to this argument, if you're saying, no, 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 we should go to the beach tomorrow, and here's why I'm, your argument fails, I'm going to object to this argument, what you need to do is you need to challenge one of the premises. You need to either challenge one, two, four, or six. This argument is valid. Um, so the conclusions, even the intermediate ones, are supported by the premises. And so to challenge this argument, don't object to three or five. Um, it's, it's similar reasoning to why we don't object to conclusions. You want to actually look at the author's reasons for those conclusions and not just say that conclusion is false. It's a little more complicated here because three and five are conclusions, but they're also kind of acting like premises as well. So what you want to do is you want to actually look at the reasons the author gave for three and five and object to those. You don't want to object to three and five. So in this case, you could object to premise one, two, four, or six. So that's our seventh tip. Don't object to intermediate conclusions of compound arguments. Actually object to the author's reasons or premises for those conclusions. Okay, so now let's review our seven tips. Don't criticize an argument by denying its conclusion. Don't accept an argument simply because you believe the conclusion. Direct criticisms at individual premises. Make your criticisms of premises substantial. Don't distinguish between facts and opinions. Instead, you can talk about what our evidence supports and what our evidence is still doesn't have a verdict on yet. Don't accept competing arguments. And don't object to intermediate conclusions of compound arguments. And much of the content from this was taken from Feldman's Reason and Argument, Chapter 7.